The Atheist Debates Patreon Project presents Debate Review, Mariology with William Albrecht. How are we doing? This is the final video and final debate review of 2022. Um, and this is about a debate I did just the other day. And some of it's going to sound familiar to some of you because I had previously debated Mariology um, some time ago and did a video about it afterwards where I talked about it. Evidently, the video that I did really bothered my debate opponent for this debate, so much so that he sought me out to do the debate, uh, to arrange it, to pay an honorarium, uh, and then engage in the debate. Mariology is the study of Mary, the mother of Jesus, or the purported mother of Jesus. And in the debate, I didn't bother going down the route of mythicism at all. Um, I did, though compare it to Martha Kent, Superman's mom, and studies of other things like that to show that there are fictional creatures that we have more information about than we do about the purported incredibly significant in Catholicism and other Orthodox uh, views. Mother of the supposed Lord. So William had watched my video on Mariology and wanted to debate me on the subject. And he's the one that suggested the topic, is Mariology reasonable? I instantly agreed. Uh, there are times when in setting up debates, I will push back on debate topics. I'm always pleased when somebody suggests a debate topic where they are clearly going to take a po an affirmative or a positive position, and I am clearly going to take a negative position. Um, is Mariology reasonable? No. That's my assessment. I'm not claiming that that's necessarily a fact, but you're trying to you know, present your case for why this is. He also suggested the format, which I agreed to. I often push back on the format because I would like to have uh, better and more productive conversations, but I gave him everything he wanted. This did not go well. Some would say it didn't go well for either of us. That's fine. Um, it was incredibly heated. I think I probably told him to shut up half a dozen times. And he misrepresented my positions multiple times, even after immediately after, or almost immediately after I had clarified my position, he reversed it. Now, when the debate was over, we talked for a few minutes afterwards, and we're both interested in potentially doing it again, because William learned something during this debate, and I'll get to that at the end. Um, at no point am I trying to trick someone. I don't need to trick someone. The burden of proof is on the religious. And if they haven't demonstrated it in the centuries or millennia that it's been around, you don't need to trick them. There's nothing tricky about saying, can you demonstrate the truth of what you're saying? Um, I was also, when I was disagreeing with him on what I had or hadn't said, <clears throat> uh, not trying to dodge or avoid anything. There had clearly been some confusion and some misunderstandings. In the future, what I'm going to suggest we do, and I would suggest this for anybody else, is say, okay, don't come at me with what you think I've said. Ask for clarification or say, is your position X? No. And, let, and, and go from there. Because even if I said what you think I said, or even if you said what I think you said ages ago or in another video or wherever else, it could have been a mis somebody could have misspoken. Um, a misunderstanding. There could be additional context or anything else. Um, but at, we, we may do this again, but only after we agree to a way to cross-examine each other without him misrepresenting my positions, refusing to answer yes or no questions, which he did, and then thinking I'm trying to trick him when all I care about is clarity and truth. Um, on the topic of the debate, what makes something reasonable? Now, for a particular belief... Mary was a perpetual virgin. Is that a reasonable belief? It's reasonable if it is the result of sound epistemology and supported by the evidence that would warrant a conclusion that it is true or likely true. So you can talk about whether or not a position is reasonable. I wasn't clear whether or not you could talk about whether or not a field of study is reasonable. That may mean something different because that's not a belief. It's not even necessarily about the beliefs, but he had a hard time distinguishing um, the difference between the truth of the claims within Mariology and uh, the reasonableness of the claims within Mariology and the reasonableness of Mariology. And on more than one occasion, he kept saying, well, you, you don't think this is true. It doesn't matter at all whether or not I think Mary was a perpetual virgin. 
as to whether or not I think studying Mariology or participating in that field of study is reasonable or a, re or a reasonable use of time. And that's how I'm evaluating, is a field of study reasonable? It's really just a couple of things. Is it a reasonable use of time, which yes, is gonna be a subjective assessment. If you like something, you can do it. But the, the foundation of what I think most people would consider it reasonable is, is it reasonable that new discoveries and insights will be gained? Which is why I asked him, what have we learned about, or about Mary? What have we learned from Mariology in the last 200 years, thousand years, whatever? And he acknowledged there's nothing new to learn. The revelation happens once. It exists in the Bible. You can't go to extra biblical sources. And there's a dispute as to whether or not there's a contemporary extra biblical source that refers to, to Mary at all. I would say uh, I need to look up the, the one that he referenced um, so that I can find more information. But I thought that he said it was from 70 CE, which means it's not contemporary. Um, although it could be from someone who was alive to reference it. But at one point, there was a discussion about Luke claiming that Mary took a vow of virginity, um, which I'm not going to get into today, but I'm, I, have, I have my concerns about that particular take on this as well. But the question that I was trying to ask during the Q&A is, is it possible to take a vow of virginity and not keep it? And William's dogmatic refusal to just answer that simple yes or no question with a mere yes ended the cross-examination period or led to the end of the cross-examination period. It was yes, but we know that didn't happen in this case. Now, if you would have just said yes, my intended follow-up question to that yes was going to be, how can you know that did or didn't happen in this case? Is it possible for someone to take a vow of virginity and not keep it? Yes, we all know the answer is yes. For this to be the 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 the, the ground where he planted his flag, uh, to, uh, the hill that he's going to die on, everybody on the planet, with a couple of exceptions, would understand. Is it possible for someone to take a vow of virginity and not keep it? Yes, of course it is. Cool. How do we know whether or not it was kept in this circumstance? That was going to be my follow up. But he had already repeatedly misrepresented my positions, stated some of them to be the exact opposite of things I had just clarified, proving that he wasn't listening. And from the very beginning, he was trying to hold me accountable for things I said in a separate video about Mariology instead of what I was saying in this debate. He walked into this with an ax to grind over a video that bothered him, and he wanted me to know that he was going to be the one in charge. Cool. Whatever. But if you're just going to say, yes, but we know that didn't happen, why can't you just answer the question? I'm leading towards something. I'm in a courtroom. It would have been objection, your honor, non-responsive. Please instruct the witness to, you know. Um, he accused me or assumed that I thought all of the Bible was false, which isn't my position. He also said, that I was wrong about Luke and Luke was writing as a historian, which implies that I had suggested Luke wasn't writing as an historian. I never suggested that. I never said it. And I demanded that he actually provide evidence to back up his charge. It was a, a, a kind of a, a slanderous representation. Uh, he put up a straw man. I never said Luke wasn't writing as, a tor as an historian. So why would you then say, you're wrong about Luke? He was writing as an historian. It didn't happen. Now, if he'd have just said yes, he would have had time to give the second part that he, he just couldn't stop. Yes, but we know it didn't happen this time. And we know it didn't happen. He would have been able to give that both in the, in the, as a response to the question that follows it up and give us an explanation for how he knows that. I think the reason he was doing it is because he saw that he was getting to me. And he knows that if you say, how do you know that this vow was adhered to? How do you know that Mary didn't violate this vow? He has no answer. He has no way to demonstrate that. There's not, there's not a single document or anything that says, and Mary did this forever. And even if there was, you'd have no way of demonstrating that that document is accurate. I could say, hey, I took a vow of virginity and I kept it until the day I died. Doesn't mean it's true. He would have had time to give all of those things but instead, 
He was being non-responsive and then said that he would refuse to answer any yes or no questions. And at that point, I ended the cross-examination. I probably had about 10 or 12 minutes left because I just don't care to participate um, with someone who's trying to control both their cross-examination and mine. He wanted his cross-examination time to be the way he wants it, and he wants my cross-examination time to be the way he wants it. Yes, I interrupted him. That's going to happen. But every single time he got, he, you know, he would say, stop, I stopped. At another point, we had a disagreement about a passage in Mark chapter 6, just two little verses, and the disagreement was about the Greek words and their usage. Um, and I think he expected me to not be prepared for this because while I'm not a scholar and I don't speak and read Greek, I am able to study it and I have really good resources and Bible dictionaries and tools that allow me to gain an understanding. And this is something that I had studied before. Where he lost here, for sure, is when he claimed that, or he, I challenged him on something, and he, he said that this would be the case, that no Greek scholar would ever affirm that a particular word could ever be used in a poetic sense, in one sentence, in response to a different word being used literally in the previous sentence. That is an absolutely preposterous proposition. First of all, it's, it's preposterous to say that there's no Greek scholar that would ever hold any position. I don't even have to go talking to my friends who are Greek scholars to know that that's not true. You make those sort of universal statements. It's grandstanding. It's hyperbole. And he was constantly doing it. Every scholar agrees with this. Everything they just, all Greek scholars would do this. It's how you know someone is not arguing in good faith and not being honest when they start making those uh, universal declarations. He also said that this disagree disagreement about Mark chapter 6 alone, on its own, demonstrated how Mariology is reasonable. But that disagreement wasn't about Mariology, it was about Greek grammar. And what it demonstrates is that he doesn't understand what makes something reasonable. What he seems to value is that he isn't so much interested in Mariology, which would be the actual facts about Mary, actual statements from the Bible about Mary, but instead about expert opinions about Mary and expert opinions about the statements in the Bible about Mary. So not Mariology, that's not important to him. Metamariology is important to him. Putting together the analysis of the experts, that's what he considers to be Mariology. The thing he's studying is not the thing, but what people have said about the thing, which removes it from being, it's not science, it's barely, it, it's not pseudoscience. It's, it is fan fiction. He repeatedly showed that he didn't understand what, it, what testability is or what falsifiability is. He didn't know what steel manning an opponent's position was, which really, I can understand. What, I'm not suggesting he needs to know everything. And I'm not just beating him up saying he didn't know this, he didn't know that. Everybody should know what steel manning is. If you're going to be in a debate and you don't know what steel manning is, you should not be in the debate. Because steel manning is, instead of straw manning, where you prop up an easy mock version of your opponent's position for you to, to knock down, steel manning is where you try to prop up the strongest, most accurate representation of that person's position. That shows that you listened and that you understand what their position is and what their argument is. Um, I can steel man the Kalam cosmological arguments most of the time because I have them memorized word for word there may be a slight difference in somebody's version. It's fine. There, it's not like there's one column, but there's William Lane Craig's version is typical version because he might have changed it some from time to time. Uh, is you know everything that begins to exist has a cause for its existence. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause for its existence. Done. But if you demonstrate that you don't know what steel manning is, what testability is, what falsifiability is, and one other thing that we'll get to in a minute. Um, it's a problem. Now, William thinks that Mary's virginity is, Mary truly was a virgin uh, for virgin birth, and that Mary's perpetual virginity is testable. It isn't. Nobody's virginity at all is testable. But I'll get to that in a second. Nobody's perpetual virginity is testable. 
you don't have the ability to observe the entirety of someone's life all the time to make sure that they never had sex. It's just not the case. He also thinks that her perpetual virginity is falsifiable, but he was clear, although it took a little work to be clear because this is such a, a, a muddled concept, um, that it would be falsified if any church father had ever suggested that Mary wasn't a perpetual virgin. But that's not what falsifiability means. That's not how falsifiability works. And it, what it does is it demonstrates that he's relying on what people say rather than what is. At every single point, it's here's what people say about Mary, therefore it's true. That's not how any of this works. Ah, but if can you name any church father that ever said she wasn't? Okay, but that doesn't tell you whether or not it's true. Even if nobody objects to it, it can still be untrue. Virginity, by the way, is an absolutely nonsense concept that isn't testable in any way for anybody. Now, to be fair, um, if someone is born and instantly dies, then yes, at least in that circumstance, I suppose we could declare that um, they were a virgin. But the concept of virginity is absolute nonsense and isn't testable for people. Um, neither the physical virginity, because you can't tell whether or not, well, the presence of a hymen or absence of a hymen doesn't in any way prove uh, a, a lack of virginity or the presence of virginity. But the psychological purity virginity of in my head, I haven't had sex, I haven't experienced this, which is a really confused kind of appeal to qualia, is untestable on its face as you can't read minds. So, and certainly once you are removed from the individual, like I have no way of, of, of demonstrating uh, that somebody is a virgin. Now, if somebody winds up pregnant, like, we do a DNA test and it, the DNA test seems to confirm that William is the father. It would be a reasonable inference that William had sex and is not a virgin, but I don't give a shit about virginity because it's not, it, it is a purity culture nonsense concept that is only used to marginalize people. It doesn't refer to anything that is real or useful, but William thinks that it is testable and that it is falsifiable. He thinks it has been reasonably confirmed that there was a virgin birth, which isn't true. It hasn't been reasonably confirmed. And he thinks it's been reasonably confirmed that Mary was a perpetual virgin, which also isn't true. As a matter of fact, it hasn't even re been reasonably confirmed that Mary existed and had Jesus as a child in the first place. But if every church father says that they believe Mary was a perpetual virgin, that's good enough for him. That's his epistemology. And it isn't even in the ballpark of reasonable. He heard a story, heard that some other people believe it. Therefore, it must be reasonable to believe that it's true. That is the sum total of his epistemological warrant. No data. It's why he cares more about what people think about Mary than about what is verifiably true about Mary. How many other disciplines has this reliance on authority and fallacious appeals to authority poisoned in his mind? How many other things is he going to think is reasonable because somebody told him, because he's relying on testimony, because he's relying on opinion? Now, there's one kind of last thing to address before I sum up, and that is, and I'm going to use a word here that I have scrubbed from my vocabulary only for clarity. And that word is retarded. That word is a slur that has been used to malign and marginalize people with mental handicaps, mental defects. And William used the word specifically to refer to people uh, with mental defects. And we called him out on it. I called him out on it. The hosts, you know, lightly called him out on it as well. And people in chat, even some of them even super chatted, please go educate yourself on this. He doubled down, tried to explain to us why it wasn't a problem, and but this was in the heat of debate. Once the debate was over, he listened, and he went out and did research, and he looked it up. 
and he talked to me afterwards. He apologized properly rather than the not apology that he offered during the thing where he's like, I'm sorry if you were offended. He doesn't, he's, he's still got a long way to go to learn what a proper apology is, but he at least apologized properly afterwards, although it was just to me, and said that he plans to scrub it from his vocabulary. So don't go beating him up for that when you see the debate. That, that's the good thing that's come out of this is that despite our disagreement, despite things being heated, someone in this debate actually listened and learned something, even if it was afterwards, and is going to change this. Now, is this? I'm not going to get into a, a side discussion about the problematic nature of the word. Uh, I know it's popular; people like using it, but it'll end up in the in the comments and all this other stuff. Um, I just said that word today for the first time, and I don't know how many years, just for clarity, because believe it or not, people couldn't be bothered to Google R slur. I don't know how someone gets to 2022 and 2023 is coming up in a couple of days without knowing the problematic nature of that word. But I think in William's case, it's the same way he got to 2022 holding on to other problematic views by surrounding himself with people who don't know any better and who won't call him out on those problematic views. When you keep saying, all of the scholars in the pool that I'm selecting think X, and that makes it reasonable. It's a problem. It's a fallacious appeal to authority. It leads you to think that if the authority you rely on doesn't call you out on something, then you aren't wrong. This shifting of the burden of proof. Can you name a single church father that doesn't think that Mary was a virgin? No, and that's not relevant. It doesn't matter if they all agree. It doesn't matter whether I can name any. It doesn't mean that it's true merely because I can't point out somebody who thinks it's false. There's a confirmation bias here and a reliance on authority that has kept William from understanding sound epistemology. It's kept him from understanding reasonableness. It's kept him from understanding fallacies, the bird of proof. And just because something is important to you, which is the thing, the point that he kept making through the whole debate, or if it's important to the understanding of another subject, that doesn't make it a reasonable endeavor. He said it's important to study Mariology, to understand theology or Christology. But he didn't demonstrate that it's important to understand those things. And if those things aren't important, Mariology isn't important. But whether or not it's important doesn't mean it's reasonable. It's like saying it's important to study the star signs in order to understand astrology. That may be true, but astrology is pseudoscientific nonsense. And it may not be important at all because it's pseudoscientific nonsense. And none of that tells you whether or not it's reasonable. Now, he picked the debate and the topic. If he would have suggested as a topic, is Mariology important to William? I wouldn't have shown up. I wouldn't have done the debate. I don't care. doesn't matter to me if it's important to William. If he had suggested, is Mariology important to understanding Catholicism? I wouldn't have taken the debate because I can see how studying Mary is important to understanding aspects of Catholicism. But he suggested this debate on whether or not it's reasonable. And at no point did he even begin to get close to demonstrating why it's a reasonable endeavor or that any of the positions that he holds based on his Mariology, any of those are reasonable to accept as true. His appeals were to not the facts, not here's what the Bible says and here's the evidence that supports it. It was, here's what the Bible says, here's how it's interpreted, and here's what the church fathers think about it. It is the problem that Protestants have been pointing out with the Catholic Church since Martin Luther nailed his protest up on the door. And that is, everything is top down there. If somebody higher up with more knowledge tells you something, then it's reasonable to pursue it and reasonable to think it's true. But that's not how reasonableness works. You need to have evidence, and there needs to be in a discipline, a standard by which you can reasonably conclude that you're going to learn something new, that you're going to learn something edifying, and that your, your time spent on these efforts are not wasted. We'll see you next year. Thanks.